quick intro to say that my book Collapse Feminism, the online battle for feminism's future is now available. It's out. So you can get it online, you can get it in various bookshops. And if they don't have it in your local bookshop, then you need to ask them to get copies. Um, but yeah, if you want to, God damn it. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to support me or if you've enjoyed my content online and you want to learn more, then you can grab a copy and that will make me very happy. What do we owe each other? Some of you will probably say nothing before I even finished my questions, but let's have a discussion about it. I thought about making this video after I saw this meme. Posting, wow, super problematic, under everybody's Halloween custom, and then responding, I will not do the labor of educating you when they ask for an explanation. I find it quite funny, but you know me, I can't just smile and get on with my day. I had to overthink the whole thing for hours and days and come up with this video. Now, just to start off, I think it would be a good idea to recontextualize this notion of emotional labor, which is used so frequently now. <laughs> Originally, the idea behind this concept of emotional labor is that the worker is expected to produce a certain emotion as they are doing their job, even if they do not deeply feel that emotion. A very popular example of emotional labor is the expectation of uh, flight attendants to stay nice and energize and smile, even with their worst clients. As our economies have shifted from agriculture and industrial work to service jobs, the notion of emotional labor has become increasingly relevant. Like you were not necessarily expected to smile at those rows of corn stretching your head, ready to be cropped, but you are expected to smile at the client in front of you looking for a new sofa. The emergence of this notion and its recognition as a valid form of work was a bit of a revolution. But emotional labor isn't limited to the workplace. In her book, The Managed Heart, sociologist Arlie Rothschild talks about the emotional labor we do in our relationships. Let me give you a few examples. I uh, recently lost my grandmother and my dad and I reacted in a way that would be deemed inappropriate by many because we tried to make jokes and remain positive instead of crying and mourning. That did not mean that we were not affected by the death. It's just our way of reacting to unhappy events. We avoid looking sad and focus on the positive and make jokes. But on the day of the funeral, we knew that people would expect us to be sad. And so we did the emotional labor of you know, putting on that emotion onto our face. Another example to which I'm sure many of you will relate is when, you, when you're in love with someone, but you know that the person is bad for you or that the relationship cannot work out. And so what you do is that you tell yourself psychologically, all the bad things about this person to convince you that um, this cannot work, he's bad or she's bad. You don't actually love them, right? Well, that's emotional labor too, because you work on changing something you feel to adopt the posture that is deemed right. Hosh Charles also gave another example, uh, that of a married woman who works hard to convince herself that she is still in love with her husband, even though she is clearly not. She tells herself that lie because she cannot imagine leaving him and doing that to their children. I know way too many couples who are in this situation, it's pretty bad. I'm sure you can think of many more examples, actually you can add them in the comment section because I'm really curious. But yeah, one common feature to those experiences is that you have to put on a mask. You're like an actor playing a role, but that role is your life. And the choices you make will have real life consequences on other people. In those cases, emotional labor doesn't necessarily has a bad connotation though, since it is something you primarily do to preserve the emotional state of others. Of course, there are limits to that. Some people clearly do not deserve your time and energy, and sometimes putting on a mask for too long can have uh, consequences on your mental health, which is not good. The problem is that in our culture, so a culture heavily based on time management and productivity, we very quickly go from, quote, let me put on a mask to make the other person feel good, to, quote, I don't have the time and the energy for it, I'm sorry. In both our private and work life, emotional labor has an increasingly negative connotation. And for me, that negativity isn't so much about the fact that we have to put on a mask, so um, being fake. I mean, we put on masks all the time, we romanticize our lives, we add filters. Uh, that's not an issue. We know how to be fake and we even enjoy being fake. For me, that negativity associated with emotional labor, you know, the sort of negativity um, in that meme I showed you earlier, is rather based on the fear of feeling things, especially feeling what others uh, feel. We refuse to feel anger, joy, love, because we have more important things to do and we can't let those emotions get in the way. 
actually, let me read you a little passage from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was a philosopher, to contextualize uh, this conversation. Quote, In a social system animated by competition for property, the human personality was metamorphosed into a form of capital. Here, it was rational to invest oneself only in properties that produced the highest return. Personal feeling was a handicap since it distracted the individual from calculating his best interest and might pull him along economically counterproductive path. End of the quote. When I first read this passage, I couldn't help but think, we live in that society. <laughs> and sure we do. Rousseau wrote this passage during the mercantile era, stretching from the 16th to the 18th century, which put a huge emphasis on maximizing profit, on trade, etc. Mercantilism also set the basis for entrepreneurship, culture, Hustle culture, yes. <laughs> and so that's why you have this uh, belief that emotions are to be mastered, regulated in order to be successful at business. Actually, Hochschild wrote that around that time, and that's super interesting, um, insincerity was a quality to be admired. She writes, at this period in history, there was an increasing rate of social mobility in England and France. More and more people found it possible or conceivable to leave the class into which they had been born. Guile became an important tool for class advancement. The art of acting, of making of walls, not in accord with feeling, became a useful tool for taking advantage of new opportunities. End of the quote. Now, as years went by, insincerity lost its positive connotation in favor of authenticity. These days, we love it when people put up their mask and tell the truth, their truth. On the other hand, we hate when people are openly fake, when they lie about getting uh, this or that plastic surgery, when they present themselves as progressive but support the worst human atrocities to sustain private interests. So that means that even though we stopped valuing uh, insincerity, Rousseau's statement is still true. You have to manage or repress emotions in order to become successful. The industry of self-care, especially pop psychology as we now call it, has taken on the role of emotion regulator in our society. It is through therapy and self-care practices that people learn how to manage how they feel and cope with external pressures put on them. As individuals, we are told that we are our biggest project, a brand almost. And like Rousseau said, personal feeling is a handicap. It's counterproductive, so you must make sure that you don't feel too much. That means avoiding conflict, avoiding situations that make you feel uncomfortable, but also avoiding entertainment, avoiding falling in love because that's a distraction, you know? Actually, wait one sec. Yeah, look at this post um, that Brad Trommel uh, reposted recently on Instagram. Basically, it is recommended to regulate your sex life because you can get infections and treatments cost a lot of money. Money you could use to build your Web3 dropshipping empire, Brad wrote. That's exactly what I mean. And you know, the problem isn't limited to hustle culture. Hustle culture is one example of how the philosophy of neoliberalism gets interpreted. Neoliberalism basically tells you, you don't owe anyone anything. Hustle bros understand that as, focus all your energy on building your brand. But there is another way to understand it, one that goes like this. Quote, I need to focus my energy on protecting my peace and well-being, which means no emotional labor from me, sorry. The interpretation is different, but the philosophy is the same. I don't owe anything to anyone. Now, if we take the second interpretation, the one based on avoiding emotional labor to preserve your peace, you have to agree that protecting your peace goes hand in hand with the idea of understanding who you truly are, you know? You are on your own journey trying to find your authentic self or your brand. That quest becomes ever more urgent as everything around us draws us towards inauthenticity, uh, insincerity. The only solution we see presented to us and encouraged by modern therapy is to turn in on ourselves and study our consciousness with concepts to produce diagnosis and um, make conclusions about who we truly are. The whole process is very self-reflective, very circular. You are the object of study and the one conducting the study. But this whole process is also very counterproductive. Let me explain why. Initially, I wanted to make a video about ghosting, uh, which for me is a good example of how we sometimes refuse to uh, do the emotional labor, so to fill things in order to protect our peace. Again, there are many cases in which ghosting is totally valid, but you see what I mean. Now, no matter the circumstances, 
ghosting requires a certain degree of self-estrangement, which is itself, and quite ironically, a form of emotional labor. By that I mean that everybody knows deep down that ghosting is not good. That's why we try to find justifications as to why we do it. It means that we feel guilty in a way. The way I see it is that ghosting requires you to kind of separate your mind and body in order to do the bad thing. The same way a flight attendant has to separate her mind and body when having to remain polite with the worst clients. The problem is that as you seek to protect your peace at all costs, as you seek to build your brand, you have to repeat those processes of self-estrangement again and again. You have to repress the emotions you are supposed to feel in order to move on. Now, how can that be compatible with the goal of figuring out who you are, finding your authentic self? When has it become too much of an effort to let things affect you and shape you? Why do we think that in order to become our true self, we have to isolate from other struggles, questions and feelings? That does not make sense to me. Now, let me tell you a little personal story. I started working part-time from an early age and I would save money to pay for cheap solo travels in Europe. My mentality at the time was to gain maturity and be independent, but also to meet people because I had been quite solitary and introspective uh, most of my life. And I thought that those travels would help me develop that and they surely did. I was so cheap so I had no Wi-Fi, no mobile data, so I was kind of forced to uh, figure things out by asking strangers um, and hoping for the best. I would sleep in hostels and I met a lot of people during those trips. I don't naturally go to strangers and talk to them, but on those trips I really try to get out of my comfort zone and ask about their lives and stories and it's insane how much I learned about myself just by talking to other people and learning about them, not me. For example, I became okay with the fact that I'm not super duper extroverted and I kind of struggle to socialize in big groups. But I also understood that I'm quite good at making conversations with individuals and bringing them to a place where they feel comfortable, uh, opening up and potentially changing their minds and that they could rely on me for honest and thoughtful advice. And you know, I could have done what I've always done, which is being okay with being quite solitary, with being by myself and um, you know, having fun by myself. But by putting myself in this slight discomfort and talking to strangers, I understood that you need that outward perspective. You need to learn about all those experiences that you yourself cannot be familiar with and that your therapist won't be familiar with either. If someone asked me, what do you owe to people? I would say everything. I mean, that's why I'm left-wing. I recognize that the person I am today is the product of so many interactions and experiences that I, that I couldn't predict. Other people made me, and it is my job to help them become the person they want to be, or at least challenge their preconceptions about themselves. Now, I want to make it clear that it's not because I criticize pop psychology that I don't uh, understand the power of self-knowledge. I do understand that introspection is essential to fully develop yourself, but what I'm trying to show in this video is that introspection cannot work alone because of how interdependent we are. Protecting your peace can be counterproductive because of the self-estrangement it requires. I don't think you will reach any sort of higher self by refusing to let yourself feel what other people feel, whether they are your family, friends, colleagues, or strangers living miles and miles away from you. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, the conversation continues in the comments section. Don't forget to like, to subscribe, if it's not already done. I would like to thank my patrons for their support and a special thank to top tier patrons Tua Carriora, Patrick Riley, Boris, Ria, Joey, Ivan, Jason, Remy, Trebizonde, Corrigi, Toki. My camera died, so I'm gonna end this with the audio only. Tristan, Patricia, Ian, Donage, Ren, Alex, Manuel, Perry, and thank you to all the other ones who prefer to stay anonymous. And before I let you go, I need to talk to you about our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. You can create your own website around your preferred aesthetic from a catalogue of templates and use it as a landing platform for all the activity you do. YouTube, online shop, blog, podcast, photography, etc. Once that is set up, you can connect all your social media accounts and share content between different platforms. Squarespace can also help you create effective email campaigns to really connect with your community. Finally, they have this very cool feature where you can connect and learn from other creators like Adrien Raquel, who will show you how you can best use the platform. If you feel like Squarespace is made for you and you want to check it out, go to squarespace.com 
for a free trial. And when you've experimented and you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash alicecapel to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring the video. And yeah, that's it. Salut!